And so all judgment can be completely removed from our heads, God. So all guilt cannot distract us from what you have to offer. I declare that this is holy ground and that you are welcome here. And I ask that you do not let us speak, but that you speak through us. May we not hear a word of any man this weekend, but use this God, use our mouths to speak your words. May us not be just motivated by the words we hear this, this weekend. May we just not lift our spirits like a small flame, but may we learn who you are, God. We want to know you because we know that excitement lasts maybe until Tuesday or Wednesday, but knowing you, understanding your word and what you have to teach us, that is what keeps us in the right path. And we are here not to meet each other. We are here to know more of you, God. We're here to learn who you are and who you want us to be. So please, Holy Spirit, please, Fill up our hearts. Shield our ears so we we don't want to hear words of people, but we want to hear your words. Bless whoever pick up the microphone. May this person be completely dominated by your spirit, God. So you can speak to us. I declare, God, that Whatever accusations are ringing in our ears, weighing us down, I declare they're, they're cast away, God. We're blinded. We're, we're completely secured by Jesus Christ's blood, all of us. I declare that we're all completely holy and ready to receive your Holy Spirit shining through us, giving us visions, giving us the boldness to speak to share what you reveal to us Holy Spirit bless brother Chidera bless Ekaba and bless us all so we can all speak words that come directly from heaven words that we need to hear ourselves so we can understand the message you have for us and whatever plans we make God we you put those plans at your feet so you can change, you can move things around. This is your meeting, God, not ours. So do as you please. Fill us with your heart, with your wisdom. And clean us from whatever we learn from other people, the culture, the religion. We don't want any of this. We want you, God, and you alone to speak to us. Not our prejudices, not our fears, not our guilt. We don't want to speak, God. We want to be used by your Holy Spirit to speak. Clean up our ears, God. We know that in your word, sometimes your spirit was avoiding some people to understand what you had to say. And I, I beg of you, Jesus. Grant us the privilege of understanding what you have to tell us. Grant us the benefit of wisdom to understand what you have to share with us this weekend. And please, Jesus, make yourself home because this is all for you. May this weekend be not only not only a moment for us to get to know you and approach you and be more like you but also a gift to you a sacrifice may our worship be pleasant to you God because you are worthy and please Holy Spirit teach us how to worship you teach us how to present ourselves in a way that is pleasing to you so use us God guide us teach us give us the the gift of understanding. And may this weekend be far from ordinary, God. We want to feel you here. We want, we want visions. We want prophetic 
words coming out of our brother's mouths. We want healing, supernatural healing, God. We're not here to be mild. We're not here to be secular or normal. We're not here to be ashamed of letting go. We're here to know the fullness of you, God, the fullness of what your spirit has to offer. So whatever keeps your Holy Spirit from unleashing itself, cleanse us, God, from all that so your spirit can flow through us and heal and give us visions and gifts so we can praise you, so we can understand more of you, so we can learn. And may whatever we learn here today not be motivation, but a deep understanding, knowledge that will assist you when we're on our daily lives and don't know what to do when we're getting distracted. May we rem- remember not of something that we felt for a moment, but something that we know, that we learned. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. It's, it's good to see you. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard very, very uh, amazing and great things about you. You know, and even <laughs> Brother Clay also. I've met Pedro and uh, Lynn, but <laughs> I've not met Brother Clay and, and the Myers. Yes, thank God. Thank God for his help. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Actually, let me just. So before I. Who? Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, Jonathan. When I came. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Yes, not one of us here will be made exempt, shall be exempt from the things that the Lord has promised us. You know, there are a lot of things that have been promised and uh, the promise of God has been fulfilled. The promise of God has been fulfilled because the fulfillment of the promises of God is Jesus. And the Bible says, the book of Romans, that all the promises of God are answered in Christ. It says, in he, all the promises of God are yea, and in him we say amen to the glory of God. So all the promises of God are answered in Christ, and we can be rest assured. And I really love that scripture, you know, in Isaiah. I quoted it in Isaiah while um, the scripture from the book of Isaiah, which I quoted while I was, I was praying. And there's a song about, about it too. It's, I think it's Isaiah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Jeremiah. <laughs> yeah, it's in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, you know, that's where the song is. It's a scripture. I think it is verse 12. No, 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 don't worry. I will just, I'm not going into you. But it's, it's, a, it's a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 12. Although the song was, it was, uh, it was, the song was coined from using the King James version. So it might not be exactly in, I don't know the versions of the Bible. But it's, it's so powerful. In fact, verse 11 actually says, For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed, ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. And Jacob, I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to take any chances, but so I will try to be as granular as possible. But Jacob is a type of you and I. You know, all through scripture, all through, I can, I can use this, right? Jacob is, a, Jacob is a figure. Or Okay, you know what? Instead of using a figure, I will say that Jacob is a type of us, you know. And Jacob particularly 
it's a type of us in our old self, you know, in our struggle, in our old self. Um, Jacob is a promised seed. I don't know how many of us, I mean, it's a rhetorical question if I ask how many of us know Abraham, but we all know Abraham, you know, and um, God made promise to, to Abraham after the fall, you know, and uh, in the process of time, God made his promise to Abraham. Abraham did not have a child for years, and him and his wife Sarah looked for um, a child, and they had none. And God appeared to him, made promises to him, and after some, in the process of time, God fulfilled that, that promise. And he said, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be called. You know, the, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. In fact, the immediate fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, that promised seed, the immediate fulfillment was his son Isaac. So Isaac, you know, Isaac was the immediate fulfillment of the promise. But however, that seed that God spoke to Abraham about was actually speaking of Christ. When he said, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be called. It was actually pointing to Christ. And we're going to see this theme all over scripture. Scripture is a build up from Genesis. It is a build up to Jesus Christ. Everything ultimately points to him. That was why Jesus told his disciples in the book of Luke that everything that is spoken of me in the prophets, in the, in the Psalms, in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, all testify of me. And these three things actually is what make up the Bible. The Bible, is that, the Bible that we have. The law, you know. Uh, please, can you find that scripture for me in the book of Luke so that we can also see Prophets and the Psalms. So, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. When you, you understand that, it's a key that opens the scripture to you. That these things that we read, even when we talk, we read stories in the Bible, everything, the, the, the Bible is, a, is, is an inspired, um, is, is written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And these things were all pointers to the main person, which is Jesus Christ. So the law, you know, the, when you read your Bible from either, either historical accounts, Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, and De Deuteronomy, that can be called the law. The, the prophets, you can find it. The book of, we read Isaiah, we read Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you know, different, Joel, different things. Even David, a lot of things. Those are the prophets and the Psalms, you know, and these things, make up, rather, sorry, I, I said the Bible, but these things make up the Old Testament. The Old Testament, sorry. And Jesus, of course, came. You know, Jesus came in the transition era between the Old and the, and the New. And, and the Bible said that everything that was, rather, Jesus said everything that was written were all speaking of him. So that is a key to understanding, you know, this thing. So when we now see Isaac, Okay, Luke 24, 27. Is it, is it possible to, 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 to read it? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written in all the scripture about himself. About himself. What was written concerning scripture about himself. So, the things that we read in our Bibles, you open some random books. You know, in, uh, in the Bible, those things are not just, <laughs> they are not just abstract. They are life and they are in, in them are hidden gems. You know, I'm talking gem, G-E-M-S, you know, pr precious things that speak of Christ. So coming back again to, to Isaac, I'm laboring so much to, uh, everything I'm, I'm saying is, is, is to just drive at the point. Isaac was that immediate fulfillment and Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And God continued his covenant with Jacob. With Jacob. God continued his covenant with Jacob. And, but later on, after a unique experience, Jacob had an experience with God. You know, he had an experience and his name was changed to Israel. And that was what gave birth to the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel came from Jacob. But however, the origins of the, 
nation of Israel is unique. I'm talking about the physical Israel because God had to go carve out a nation out of the, of the earth for himself. And that is actually what the Lord has done for each and every one of us. He called us out from our pagan ways, from our old lifestyle, and he brought us unto himself and gave us a new name. Because this, the origin of Jacob, his father was Abraham, and Abraham was not a Jew. It, it trust us to know that Abraham was not a Jew. The Bible even says it in the book of Ezekiel. It says, your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. It's referring to Abraham and Sarah. That means the Amorites and the, and the Hittites are Gentiles. So God called Abraham a Gentile and out of him, called him out and made him a nation. And that was what, what you came, where came for the nation of Israel. So even Isaac was not a Jew. Abraham was not a Jew. The Jewish race, as you can see, began from Jacob, who later became Israel. So we can say that Jacob, in a way, represents, you know, our old self and Israel is, you know, the new. So in that light, understanding Jeremiah 31, Sorry. it says, e Ezekiel chapter 16, yes, verse 3. Verse 3. This is what the Lord God says to Jerusalem. Your beginnings and your ancestors in. were in the land of the Canaanites. The Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. A Hittite. So your beginning is not Israel. Your beginning is in the land of Canaan. Canaan is a terrible Gentile nation. Those guys did the most terrible things that God had to destroy them. <laughs> God had to redeem. They were so terrible. And that was where Abraham was. So he says your nativity is not even is in the land of Canaan. You know, but out of such a, 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 a background, God called out a people for himself. So this is not what we are talking about today. But I just... I want to read this scripture to encourage us. Jeremiah 31 verse 11. Having that understanding, it says, For the Lord had redeemed Jacob. So now that we see that, we know in a, in a way it's talking of you and I. However, immediately it's speaking about Jacob, the nation of Israel, but prophetically is speaking of the church. And the church is a composition of the individual and the corporate assembly. That is what the, the church is. So when you see the church, you, you and I, first of all, as individual, because the church is the temple of the living God, and we are the temple of God. So as individuals, but individuals coming together, where two or three are gathered, we now make up the church. So the Lord has redeemed us and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. And verse 12, it says, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. So this is speaking of us. It says, because, therefore means on the fact, but on the fact of the truth of the preceding statement, because the Lord has redeemed clay and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than you. Whatever all of us are coming out from was de definitely stronger than us. Any, the effect of the fall that affected all realms of man from spiritual to mental to physical the effect of the fall as sin there is a spiritual depravity of man mentally we can call examples of things is it is it depression mentally is it you know suicidal tendencies is it addictions whatever you know is it even physically sicknesses and diseases those are the effects of the fall. And those things are stronger than us. But the word of the Lord is saying, it says that the Lord has redeemed us and ransomed us from the hand of he that was stronger. Because of that, therefore they shall come. And that is the word of prophecy concerning us. Each and every one of us will be found in this class in verse 12. It says, therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. When you see a people gathered and sing, gathering with songs it is always an aftermath of redemption if you go to the book of of revelation you will see a group of people also coming with 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 songs you know you see them coming with songs with singing you know and uh, so it says therefore they shall come and sing in the height of zion that means we shall get to that fullness of god and they shall flow together toward the goodness of god of the lord it says why 
they would rejoice because of the abundance of wheat and the abundance of wine and the abundance of oil. Enough for the young of the flock and the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow anymore at all. This same thing was also said in the book of, of Revelation when he said he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. So these things, beloved brethren, are not abstract. These are incredibly powerful things and we must continue to, um, to proclaim it concerning ourselves. I love that song. It's a song. It says, Therefore they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of God for wheat and for wine, for oil and for the young of the flock and the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow anymore at all. It's incredibly powerful. All these things, time fails us to enter into what they mean, the, what the wheat, the wine, and the oil. But these things are, are, are all spiritual sim, symbolisms for the, uh, present realities in our lives made available by Christ Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. All right. Praise the name of the Lord. Today, we want to talk about uh, the scripture that was given to me. It says the comforter is here. The comforter has come. And I can put it in, a tit- in what I can title, living in the authority and power of the comforter of these last days. Living in the authority and power of the comforter of these last days. And one can begin to ask me, what do you mean by the comforter of these last days? What, is there another <laughs> comforter? But, um, okay, let us read John chapter 14, verse 16. The book of John, we'll start there. John chapter 14, verse 16. <coughs> and, um, okay. John 14, verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, that is the, the anchor script, uh, text. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Note, with emphasis on forever. So, I will pray the Father, and he shall give another comforter who shall abide with you forever. But pray the comforter and he shall give the father and shall give you another comforter who shall abide with you forever. You know, and so and then the topic we are saying living in the authority and in the power of the comforter of these last days. And for us to live in the authority and power of something, that means that we must have understanding. And that is the goal of what God will help us with this weekend that we will be a people of understanding, to understand what we have, what has been made available to us. The Bible says that man that is in honor and understanded it not will die like a beast in the field. That, that is crazy. A man that is in honor but does not understand. And we have used this, this analogy a lot of times. Imagine if you are, you are, you have, I don't know, this, you know, maybe something from the, the U.S. military, you have this, well, a very wicked gun, you know, <laughs> a, a, an equipment, a machine gun, you know. And then, you know, let's be very practical. Maybe you are a, a lady and you have a machine gun by you. And maybe you, you, you happen to be alone by yourself. And, a, and a, a burglar breaks into your house and you have the gun by you. But you do not even know or understand what you have. You just think it's something, it's something random that you're holding. And a burglar breaks into your house with a pocket knife. And he threatens you. And you are shouting, oh, crap. And he steals everything from your house. And probably even kills you. And goes away. So you had a, 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 a machine gun. And someone came with a pocket knife. That is how bad it can be when there is no understanding. So we must have understanding of the power at work within us. The, the power 
of the, the effect of the, the suffering, the death and resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given. It is stronger than any atomic weapon. What we carry within us is, is explosive. Is explosive. It, it has terrorized beings both in the heavens and on the earth in time past. It was that same power. What we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It was that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. According to the scripture. He said that same power that brought again our Lord Jesus from the dead. Do you know what it means? Have you, I don't know how many of us have, have seen a dead body before. If you have seen a corpse, you can, you can have a picture of the, the, or rather you can understand the power of death. That is a very powerful thing. When you see a corpse, man, it's cold. When death grips a man, forget about it. No man is able to cheat death. Only Jesus came and defied death. And you wonder, you know, the devil was so moved. I don't even know what moved the devil that he thought he could actually hold Jesus in the grave. Because... I've always thought, you know, to myself, before Jesus even died and resurrected, the, the spirits of death and the grave have seen that this guy was able to deliver people from our hands. Nobody, no force has been able to deliver people from the hand of death as, ex, except by this same Holy Spirit we are talking about in the Old Testament when the whole Holy Spirit will come upon people like, like um, Elisha, you know, and he was able to raise the dead and, and Elijah. So maybe, okay, actually, that makes sense. Maybe that was what gave the devil some comfort. Elijah, Elisha raised the dead. Well, we still have Elisha with us. That's the power of death. He raised the dead, but we still have him with us. So maybe this guy, what, what difference is he? And the devil went and everything moved the nation of Israel and they crucified him. But when Jesus went down, by the power, this same thing we are talking about, the power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to break the hold of death. And that's why he said in the book of Revelation that he now has the keys of hell and death. I mean, he has, he has because he has destroyed it, he has the keys. That means, that simply means that Jesus is able, imagine if you say someone has the keys of death. If I have the keys of death, I will be a very famous man. People would, people would just grab around because that means to have the keys of, imagine they put you in a cage and they say, this person has the keys. So if I have the keys of death, anybody that dies, oh, I just, I just take the keys and open, and, feel, and the person comes back to life. Jesus said that he has the keys of death. And that death begins spiritually. Let us understand, when we say death, death begins spiritually. It's first of all a separation from God. And that is where death begins. When Adam sinned, the Lord told Adam before he sinned, that in the day you eat this of, the, of this food, you shall surely die. But did Adam die in that day he ate the food? The fruit? No. So that means that death begins sp spiritual. It's a separation from God. That is what death is. And as it continues, it continues to, to, to permeate into other realms of our being and terminates even in the, in the physical demise. So that's what death is. So that means to us also it begins... Coming in the new life begins spiritual. And if Jesus said that he has the keys of death, that means that he is able to deliver us from any spiritual condition. Not only us, but our generation, our seed. But when we understand the power of Christ, we can speak concerning ourselves. If it be weaknesses of the flesh, there are things that hold people in captivity. It could be bad habits, characters, there are all manner of things. But understanding the power of Jesus. So that is what we are going to believe God to talk about today. It says, I will send another comforter and he shall abide with you forever. Forever. Now, what is the context of John chapter 14 that we just read? It's interesting. John chapter 14 is actually quite an emotional chapter because the disciples, I could imagine them, they were they were, not, they were not happy at all. And put yourself in their shoes. It makes sense. Imagine having Jesus live in your house for three and a half years. 
Do you, do you, just imagine that. That is, that is mind blowing. Jesus lives in your house for three and a half years. And you just enjoy him. Anytime you are sick, when they say hey, there's COVID-19, you wouldn't even bother to wear a mask. You just you go and be dancing on the street. When you get the COVID, you just enter and Jesus just touches your head and you're good. Imagine, that's like your personal cheat code for life. You have Jesus with you. And that was the, the situation of the disciples. They had Jesus with them. And that was why <laughs> when some people were disturbing the disciples of Jesus, they didn't understand who these guys were. They said, Lord, uh, I think it's the, the disciples of John. John the Baptist. They said the disciples of John the Baptist are fasting. Why don't your, why don't your disciples fast? <laughs> Jesus said, look at these guys. These guys, don't, they don't understand. He said, they have, they have, how did this scripture put it again? I am paraphrasing. But it says, they have the, the bride, is it the bridegroom? They have the bridegroom amongst them. So uh, there's no need for them to fast. So while other people are fasting, the disciples of John are fasting and pressing on these guys were chilling, they were relaxing because they had Jesus right there. Do you know who Jesus is? The very, the very God made in, uh, in flesh and dwelling amongst you. They had him enjoying him for three and a half years. They were so spoiled. They couldn't even fast. That, and he now said, he said, don't worry, but when I go, then they will fast. But now I'm here. They should, they, there's no need. And that was the case before John 14. Before the John 14 that we are reading. They were all, they were all, they had been used to him, enjoying Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is beginning to tell them, uh, I would have to die. No wonder Peter allowed the devil to use him to say, this will not be unto you. If I'm Peter, I'll probably, I'll probably do the same. You know, if I'm Peter, in fact, maybe if I know that they are building, they are already constructing the cross to crucify him, I'll go and steal the cross. Because I wouldn't want this guy <laughs> to go. They, they knew that is... <laughs> they didn't want him to go. Because they were enjoying. They were, they, there were a lot of benefits from having him. So that was the, the context. Anytime. So imagine having Jesus with you. Powerful. You want to get... A job, you just say, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he just gives you, you have a job paying you six, six figures. That was the life they were living. And then Jesus now begins to tell them that he has to, he has to go. And that was why you see the beginning of John 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And he began to speak to them. But imagine someone of the caliber of Jesus and the enjoyment that these people had just by having him. And then, Jesus is saying that, now, first of all, think about what on earth can fill that kind of void. A void like Jesus. What on earth can you think of that can fill a void like Jesus? But Jesus is saying <laughs> that if you, have, if you think you have enjoyed me, there is another <laughs> experience that you will have that would even give you a, do, a double enjoyment as you are enjoying. So let us stop him for a moment to think about this thing that we have so commonly called the Holy Spirit. It's incredibly powerful. Something that is not only able to fill the void of Jesus, but to even give us greater experiences. Jesus said, you, if you see the works I do, I'm doing great works. He said, greater works shall you do. That is the power the, and the awesomeness of the Holy Spirit. So that's why he said, I will give you another comforter. So Jesus was there in the capacity of a comforter. You know, but he said, I will give you another comforter and this one will abide with you forever. Now I have to go physically, but this one is going to come in a different way. You will not necessarily see him in a physical bodily manifestation, but he's, he's going to come and he's going to be given to you and he will dwell within you and he will dwell with you forever. And it's because of this, Paul can say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. How is Jesus? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Son of God. It's the spirit of Christ, which we will see in scripture. You know, so it's the spirit of Christ. And it says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. So it's, a, it's, it's amazing. So that's the context of John chapter 14. He said, I will give another comforter. And the truth about the matter is that man has been looking for a comforter from right from the inception of time when the four 
of man came, Adam sinned, the judgment of God was harsh. And the judgment of God continues to be harsh. It never changes. You know, <laughs> the judgment of God was harsh upon mankind. And man was suffering to the extent that when they have children, they begin to inquire. Because when Adam fell, God told Adam that he's going to have a seed. That the seed of, in fact, the scripture says the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. So God told Adam that he was going to have a seed. So do you know that these guys were looking for that seed diligently? When they have children, they are looking. And in fact, it's in the same spirit in Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. When the man Noah was born, I don't know how many of us know of Noah. When Noah was born, they named him Noah because of that expectation. Noah means rest. And they said, this one will comfort us. Let's read it very quickly. Genesis chapter, chapter 5, verse um, 29. Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. It says, um, yeah, and, and he called his name Noah. This is when Noah was born. Saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work. And toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So they said, wow. And I'm sure there was something they must have seen about the baby Noah, right from a baby. They said, he will comfort us. And indeed, Noah stood in the capacity of a savior. But however, he was limited. He couldn't do much. That he, to the extent that he was only able to save his family. <laughs> he was only able to save eight souls. So Noah himself was a figure, a pointer of Christ. He came in the capacity of a savior. He says, this one will comfort us. So man has been looking for a comforter right from the inception of time. There has been a search for a comforter. Job, I remember Job in Job chapter 9, verse 33, lamented and said, is there no days man? You know, a, a days man simply means like a, 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 a mediator. If you read it in Job chapter 9, verse 33, it says, Is there no this man who would stand to reconcile him and God? You know, and he said, Because if when that happens, he will, he will be able to be free of the fear of God's judgment. So you can see that there has been a pursuit, a search for this comforter. You know, but we thank God because the desire of Job for a mediator has been fulfilled in Christ. You know, for for all who receive him. The desire of Job has been fulfilled in Christ for all who receive him. You know, so um, other comforters have come, but other com comforters have all been temporary. So we have God's judgment. Let me paint a, you know, a brief picture for you. Remember, I, okay, I shouldn't have cleaned that. He said forever. So we have, we have, we have God's, so that I will save Time and space. This truck is not. Okay. So we have judgment. Because of the judgment of God, these people, we all needed a comforter, a helper. You know, <laughs> needed a, the judgment of God was severe. And we had judge, God's judgment. Then we had different people coming in the capacity of comforters. But all, all of them were all temporary. So we had temporary, what we can call temporary comforters like judges. I don't know if you can give examples. Judges, prophets, priests, priests, kings, and the likes. These were all what we can call temporary comforters. In the time of the judges of Israel, whenever there was a judge, now the judges of Israel can be found in the book of Judges. So Genesis, Revelation, Genesis, Levi Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges is the seventh book in your Bible. And as the name of that book implies, it just gives us a chronology of the different judges in Israel. In the, in, whenever a judge of Israel was alive, the people always enjoyed but when a, the judge dies, their enemies come and begin to oppress them. So the judges were temporary comforters. 
Imagine living in the day, Israel living in, in the time of Samson. Samson is a guy that one guy would kill 1,000 men. He used bone. He used the bone of a donkey to kill 1,000 soldiers. These are not just 1,000 children running around. Samson, Sam, no. These are trained soldiers, hardened men. And this guy took, he, he, he wanted to, fight. he didn't find anything. He found the bone of the skull of a donkey. And he picked the, the skull of the, of the donkey, one, and killed 1,000 men with one blow. So you can imagine that kind of, I'm sure he was giving it one blow per person. On the, boom, the strength of that guy. This was, this was Samson. When Samson was around, the Phili no Philistine could oppress Israel as long as Samson lived. The Bible said that as long as a judge was alive, Israel dwelt, dwelt safely. But when a judge dies, that they would go and sin and their enemies would come. So these judges stood. But what, as beautiful as Samson, as Jephthah, the different judges of Israel, Gideon, you know, um, Deborah, all of them, as wonderful as they were, they were temporary. The prophets came. Imagine, Israel under the time of, for example, the prophet um, Elisha, for example. Do you know that these people, they will be fighting war. Elisha would stay, the king of Syria would be inside his bedroom, his, bed, his bedroom with his generals, discussing war strategies. Elisha would be in his own room in Israel. Think about, let's just put it, somebody is in Germany. Your enemy is in Germany. You are across the Atlantic in Canada. And there are these things that they are discussing inside their bedroom. You, you are in your room in Canada and you are hearing everything. Elisha would stay and hear. And the king of Syria had to bring all his guys. Because each time they go and attack, they will say that their plans have been, <laughs> have, have been, uh, have been, have been sabotaged. And the king of Syria had to bring his men. I don't know if we are enjoying these stories. It's a very interesting story, you know. <laughs> the king of Syria will have to bring his, brought his guys and say there is a traitor amongst us. Somebody is betraying us. And they had to tell him, no, no, O oh king, no, no, no. He said there is, there is an ear. In, in, uh, there is an ear in Ziti. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm the one putting it. There is a guy who is in Israel or so that he hears what you say in your bedchamber all the way. Can you imagine? So, Elisha would tell it to the king of Israel and they will be prepared. So, you can see how men were playing roles that it, because men stood, a, an entire nation was, was uh, so called. Even when the, um, um, this guy, um, the king of Assyria came and threatened Israel, he told Israel that he's going to give them their, <laughs> he's going to give them their, um, oh God, I don't know the, a more refined way to, to say this. He's going to give them their, you know, um, yeah, actually, <laughs> he's going to give them, <laughs> he's going to give them their peace to drink. That is when you go and pee. A king came and defied the whole nation of Israel in, in the book of Isaiah. I said he will give them their pee to drink and their, their excrement, he will give it to them to eat. Because they cannot deliver themselves. They had to run to Isaiah. The king ran to Isaiah and, and said, see what is happening? Isaiah said, don't worry. Don't be afraid of this smoking firebrand. And he, Isaiah gave a word of the Lord. And said, you king of Assyria, exalting yourself against me, I'm going to put hooks in your nose. And I'm going to put a bridle in your mouth and I will turn you around. And began to give a word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came short. And that, that is how Israel gained that, that victory. So these guys were all temporary comforters. The prophets, is it Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them. Priests that arose in the time of a priest called Jehoiada. The people made a covenant with the Lord. The kings, just think about Israel in the time of David, of King David. So these are all temporary comforters. And they were all, but they could not continue because they are not the real thing. And then until Jesus came being manifest in the flesh. And he came first to, to do a work, to show a work with a sample population of people. And that was his disciples. And he picked 12 of them. 
and to the rest he's going to speak in mysteries to every other person in parables but when he comes to his disciples he will speak plainly and all of them will be edified but jesus jesus must have stayed and looked at it and said man i don't know how many the the population of the world was at that time and jesus must have said you know if i if i <laughs> if i continue to stay in my current form I will not be able to impact this goodness. It is only this 12. And that's why Jesus said he has to go. And he said, I will send you another comforter that will dwell with you forever. So you see how all these ones were all temporary. And that's why that scripture in the book of John says, he will abide with you forever, never to depart again. And that is what we have today. And this comforter is the Holy Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. This comforter is the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit that will abide with us forever is given for virtue and power. We must understand this. The Holy Spirit is given to us for virtue and power. Virtue can speak of moral excellence. Moral excellence. That is what virtue answers to. That means it does a work within that completely transforms us. So it is for virtue and also to display the power of God. That means it is given both for an inward transformation and an outward manifestation. So that is the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Inward transformation. You see people that could be facing addictions and in one supernatural encounter, things break off from within them. It is Someone says that it is easier to lay hands on somebody who is sick and say be healed of a physical ailment and they are healed than to deliver somebody from a sickness of the soul. What are examples of sickness of, of the soul today that is prevalent amongst young people? Sexual immorality. It's a sickness of the soul. It's a sickness. It, it's, it, it's, it's something that play, it's a disease of the soul. So when you hear disease, it's not only external it begins inside and people all manner with all the shades of sexual immorality from fornication itself or is it adultery or is it pornography is it whatever it's a sickness of the soul and people struggle with this but the power of the holy spirit is a, is a no it begins with what an inward transformation it is able to deliver and change break habits that have been strongholds for years the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. If that same power was able to raise Jesus from the dead, quicken his mortal body, it is able to deliver you from any form of disease of the soul or of the mind. Is it anger issues? Is it issues we lost? Whatever it is. The power, so it begins, that, so when we say it is given for virtue, that means, or whatever, I can leave the word virtue and just say it, and inward, if this is <laughs> a man, you know, okay, actually, this man is supposed to have, to be able to depict the inward transformation, let's make the man have a big tummy. So, so if this is <laughs> a man, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit, it brings, it transforms here from the inside. And when it transforms and transforms, is also given for an outward manifestation. Outward manifestation. That is it. So that is what the Holy Spirit, we must understand this, is given for. And for virtue and for power. It begins to transform us from the inside out. From the inside out. The things that are secret. And that is where the enemy, the enemy is, does not even necessarily care first of all about the outward. He's more interested in the inside, in the secret, because he thrives in darkness and secrecy. That's why David would say, deliver me from secret faults. Is this when a person is quite on their own, they into the world. So even a, a child born in the most in the worst circumstance, there's nothing like a mis mistaken pregnancy. A soul, a spirit was made, is unique in the hands, in the in the sight of God. That each and every one of us are unique. Nobody, I've never seen, even since has not been able to prove it, prove it. Nobody, I think even identical twins, don't have the same fingerprint. Isn't that amazing? So
So you can imagine that you do you know the, what will go into the design? So God stayed in heaven and held <laughs> Pedro's finger and was designing his fingerprints. Unique. And when he was about to make his lovely wife lean, he designed a unique pattern for how many souls that have lived on the earth. Everyone uniquely, intricately, intricately made. That tells us that we are special. And if anybody has told you that you are not special, that person lied to you because you are special. We are special. Every, all of us are unique in the hands of God. And God has a purpose. And that purpose can be found in Christ and we are set free to live out the fullness of that purpose as we are empowered by his Holy Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. So that's something that we must, um, 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 we must understand and this unlocks many things for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So, is, the Holy Spirit is given for an inward transformation and for an outward manifestation. Now, let us, uh, because of time, we'll just go to begin to talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. We can examine some. But we'll begin with reading John chapter 14. Like I said, John chapter 14, maybe I'll, I'll just read the first, the first six, um, six verses of John chapter 14. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would, not, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, where I am, there ye may be also. So through the indwelling spirit in us, you know, brings us daily to the fullness of Christ. And it takes us, like we, we even sang, higher and higher into a heavenly experience. Now, if you read that verse 2, where it says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. The Greek word for the word mansion is, is abode. That means, in fact, the Greek word for the word mansion in verse 2 is the same word used in verse 23 for the word abode. So abode is like, it's another way of saying to, to abide. So it's the Greek word for the word mansion is the same thing in verse 23, if you, if, if you um, check it out, you know. So he's saying, in my father's house, there are many abodes. And then he now said in verse 3, that, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So, of course, he's talking about sending forth his spirit. So he's going to prepare. Now, what is, what is that, what does that, preparation entail that preparation is his death is is actually his death and resurrection because it's by his death is only without the crucifixion of jesus without his victory over death and his resurrection the holy spirit could not have been given unto us the scripture says it is said in another scripture that the holy spirit had not could not be given because jesus christ was not yet glorified Jesus being glorified means not just suffering and dying, but resurrecting, beating death, and being raised unto the highest. Now, Jesus is saying that when I come, this is very interesting. He says, I will receive you unto myself. That means he's coming as the Holy Spirit. That word mansion is, there are many abodes in my father's house. And that is speaking of here. The church is what? The, is, is the father's house. And inside the father's house, there are many abodes. Many abodes right here. Amen. That's what the word for mansion is to abide. Many dwelling places in my father's house. And he says, I will come and I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may also be. This, is a re this, this reality is available to us today. Amen. Where is Jesus today? He's seated in high yes. above in the heavens. No wonder no wonder the scripture 
can say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that we are seated with Christ in where? Heavenly places at the right hand of God. It is only by the Holy Spirit that we can experience that. That reality has been given to all of us by reason of the death and resurrection of Jesus positionally. That means if you are in Christ, you are supposed to be seated down there. But it can become an experiential reality in our lives. Brother Kabbalah talked about a sinusoidal lifestyle. That simply means a lifestyle that is like this. You know, so you are up on the mountain today and down in the valley tomorrow. You are up on the mountain praising God and you have a, an anger tantrum tomorrow and destroy things and break the whole place. If, if, maybe if you are angry, a tornado happens. And you go back and repent, oh God of mercy, and you are just understanding God's word. And you are down again in the valley of depression and up again of, in the mountain of praise and down again in the valley of lust. That is a sinusoidal, but it says, where I am, there you shall be, perpetually dwelling in the heavens by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. In my father's house, there are many mansions and each of those mansions are beautiful. Jesus said, I go to prepare. That preparation is by, my, is by my suffering. Each stripes he received. Do you know what it means to scorch somebody? Scorching is not flogging. With flogging, you use a whip and flog, which is bad enough. Imagine they flog you, you, you remove your clothes and they flog you. But scorching is each, each, at each end of the, of the whip, there are bottles and bones and all manner of things. You know, there at each end. And when they take the scourge at you, it's, it, you know, <laughs> it goes on your body. When they take a scourge, it goes on your body and it sinks into your skin. And when they remove it, it takes flesh out. Each one of that scourging, Jesus did it. That was the preparation. He did it for you and I individually. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. He will receive you unto himself. He will abide in you and you also will abide in him. Hallelujah. That where I am, there ye may be also. Where I am. This experience, this reality is made available to us. And when we begin to understand the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to bring spiritual things and make them real. You know, there's, there are certain ways that your eyes can be opened and physical realities pale before you. Two people, look, two people can be in the same room. But, uh, but, uh, okay, let me not use physical examples because, because since one of the examples is not a very good one, brother, there's nobody, oh, John, there's Jonathan, so I won't use John. Okay, brother, we can have Peter. I don't think anybody's name is, is Peter here. Peter and, uh, is it Peter? Okay. <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. I need to get, no, 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 I don't want to use any. Let's, we can have Bob, we can have Bob and Christopher in the same room, in this same room. We have two guys, Bob and Christopher. And Bob is in a different reality that is caught, that is exempt from his physical environment and we can see it in scripture two men were in the same place please someone find that scripture for me elijah is it elijah is it elisha and gehazi who had the servant is it yes yes um Second Kings chapter 6, verse 16. That's where that scripture is, is found. Second Kings 6, verse 16. Let us quickly read that. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 16. And soldiers came. Okay. So we had soldiers. Soldiers came to, to I don't know, a host came. And Verse 16 says, the, of, the, the servant of Elisha was afraid. And look at verse 16. 
I don't know if you are there. He says, and he answered, fear not. Elisha told his servant, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Think about that. They were in the same room. They faced the same battalion of soldiers coming to kill them. Two men in the same geographical location. And one told the other, fear not. The people with us are more than the people that be with them. And I'm sure the servants must have said, what is wrong with this guy? We are alone and we are surrounded. And you are telling me that the people with us are more than the people that are with them? And, okay, let's read it from the mouth of the scriptures. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed. He had to pray to God. And said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The mountain was full. Those were things that he could not see with his physical eye. He couldn't see them. But so this other guy had to pray and say, Lord, open his eyes that he sees. I'm telling you, this thing, this story boils down to our lives today. Are there challenges in your life? that you think are so strong? Is it habits that you think, the Bible says that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. He that is in you. So the heavenly dwelling is a reality. Two people can be in the same geographical location but exist in different realities because of, of sight, which comes by understanding. So when we begin to live in the spirit, in the consciousness, of the power of the Holy Spirit, be too busy to uh, focusing on the power that is at work in you than on the situations, than the daunting situations that are happening outside of you. That was why Jesus, in the midst of a storm, could be sleeping. Could be sleeping in the midst of a storm. He knew it is not possible. A storm, no way. And when his disciples woke him up, he says, "You guys have little faith." These stories are sweet. When, when we retalk it with our mouth, until they take you to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and you see storm. That's when you, you know that it's no child's play. You see storm. <laughs> you see that the, the force of, of water is a crazy thing. You see storm. And this guy was sleeping. And he said, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus woke up and said, what are these guys? And he just came out and he spoke and he rebuked it. Only God knows the kind of things that Jesus was seeing that gave him so much calm. No power of the fallen nature can overcome you because you have the spirit of the Lord within you. It's a mighty force. It's a mighty force. And as we begin to know more and more of it, we'll begin to enjoy that liberty. So Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many abodes. That is what the comforter has come to do, to make us his dwelling place. Abide in me and I in you. That's what Jesus said. He abides. And then we'll begin to see the purposes of this comforter, what it does from the within. From, but it's a transformation that begins from the inside. And then verse 4. So the purpose of it, Jesus said that when I come, I will receive you. And where I am, you will be. So that no wonder he told them, don't worry. I know I've been with you for three and a half years. And I know that you guys are so carnal. You are used to, you know, these physical things. Say, don't worry. I want to make you spiritual men. And that's one thing that the Holy Spirit does. It makes us spiritual men. Supernatural. You know, we become spiritual. We are not a, that's the difference between a man that is carnal. You are in touch with the physical things. So in tune with it. Things that will definitely perish. None of these things are lasting. None. Keep on saying, let us leave this place and leave this place for 100 years. And come back. This leave everything as it is. Everything here, and with no human touching things. Everything here is, sub, is subject to depreciation. The this wood maybe termites will begin to eat it. So the things that look so tangible, but what the real things, the things that are really tangible are things of the spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes us to be in touch with that reality. Verse four. I move very quickly. Verse 4 of John 14, it says, And whither I go, ye know, I'll read it in the NLT, and you know the way to where I am going. And then, they had to interject him in verse 5 and say, uh, wait a minute, no, we don't. Thomas, of course. 
You know, Thomas said, no. <laughs> we don't know. He said, we have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? So Jesus told him, I, you know the way I'm going. You know who I'm going to, and you know the way. And he said, we don't know. And then verse 6, Jesus said unto, them, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, so no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. So he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Remember, the question Thomas asked was, where are you going? We don't know where you are going. You know, and Jesus said, I am the way. Thomas said he does not know the way. And the answer of Jesus is that he is the way. And indeed, beloved brethren, Jesus is the way. Now note, he began with, you know, um, very quickly. Note, he began with the way, the way. He began with the way which leads to what? To life. He began with the way which leads to life. And Jesus said, I'm standing here to show, to show you. I'm, I'm the way. And the pathway, <laughs> the, that means like the destination. So if you want to look at this, this is the starting point, destination. Destination is life. And this word life is, is super. Of course, this life is not any life that we know it as we know life. This is the life of God. And I think I've even mentioned it here in time past. There are different kinds of life. It's not all life that is the same. <laughs> there are different kinds of life. The life of a plant and the life of an animal are not the same things. And the life of an animal and the life of a human being, human life and animal life is not the same. Even if in the taxonomy, in the biological classification, they call human and humans animals uh, but the life of an animal of a dog is not the same as the life of a human being so that's when you know that society begins to be to be there's something wrong with society crazy when they equate dogs with children and say the dog is like your child is your child my child is, is the dog they are the same that is madness the life of human is different it's, a more, it's, a, <laughs> it's more valuable, you know, before God. But we have also, we have angelic life. And then we have divine life, the life of God. And that is what Jesus has come to give to us. That we may be partakers of, he called it the divine nature of the life of God. But the way to it is truth. It's truth. So no wonder he called the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth that shall lead you into all truth. So as you begin with him the way, he leads you in the way of truth. The Holy Spirit holds your hand and teaches you. And we will see these things he does. Begins to teach you, reveal more of Christ to you. To bring you to what? The fullness of the life of God. Our born again experience doesn't just stop as being born again. I make a statement that can sound controversial. It is not enough to just be born again. To say, oh, I'm just born again. It's not enough. But we have to continue to journey in the knowledge of God. In fellowship with him. Because there is a purpose to all of this. We are heading towards the fullness of the life of God. That is manifested in character and power. Moral excellence from within. Jesus came and he was sinless. Blameless. When, he, when it was time for him to go. <laughs> in this same John. He told the disciples, he says, the prince of this world is coming. That is the rulers of this world. They are coming to take me. He said, they, they find nothing in me. They, they, they don't have any power over me. But I must obey the father. That was what he said. I think it's, the last, it's in the last verse of, of John. This John 14 that we are reading. John 14, chapter 31. Sorry, verse 31. John chapter 14, verse 31. He said, he said, but I will do, I think, okay, verse, verse 30. He says, I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me. That is, he was so morally excellent that there is nothing, he, if he wanted to destroy all of them, he could have done it. He says, but I will do what the father requires of me. 
so that the world will know that I love the Father. And he says, come, let us go. He says, that was, so such moral excellence and then power, a manifestation of power. That is the fullness of the life of God. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit within you, that is the, the, the purpose. It is the spirit of truth. But to get to him, no wonder you need to know, you cannot be talking about the Holy Spirit when you do not know Jesus. So he is the way. But all of these things, the way, the truth, and the life, the life, of course, divine life, the life of the Father, and everything, all these things, all Jesus provides all of this. That is why the scripture says, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the, the God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in him, and we are complete in him. I don't want to I don't have time to go into, into that scripture. So he says, he is the way. So that's why his answer to Thomas was, I am the way. He said, where is the way you are going? I am, you are looking at him, I'm the way. And I'm going to send to you my spirit that will lead you to all truth. He's called the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth by teaching you more of Christ. And the fullness of Christ, the life is talking about the fullness of Christ in character and power, which we can also call eternal life. The fullness of Christ in character and and in power. Hallelujah. So, so this is very uh, important. Now, let us, as we close now, let us talk about the purposes of the Holy Spirit. And there are many, numerous, but we'll just take few. The purposes of this comforter. But one thing that we have said is that we must be a people of understanding. We must understand the power that is at work in us and what has been given to us. And when we understand it, it it is the, is the, is, is can be what differentiates struggling from soaring to actually be prosperous, living a victorious Christian life, a life of true freedom, to be free. Man, that's the thing. Man thinks he's free, but we are not really free. Look, if you do anything helplessly, you are not free. Anything you do helpless, something you do beyond your will, and it's, it's, so, it's so funny. If someone comes now with a gun and makes you do something beyond, that is not, that you're not willing to do. You know, <laughs> it can be seen as a crime. You know, I, I, you, they meet Brother Clay now and say, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money. You're not willing, and maybe that was his, the last change that he had on him. And you give it, that's a crime. But many times, the diseases of the soul make us do things that we don't want to do. Many people are struggling. And we, these things, are, we can make it as practical as possible. Anger. And you just, I just, you know what? I just don't know what comes over me. When that thing comes over me, I, I, I can't. In fact, I lose myself. I don't know. I become the invincible hawk. And I, I cause so much dis destruction that is when I cool down. And you see that hawk thing? You know, <laughs> Hollywood is not, is not hey, these guys are, are some deep things. Many people are, are spiritual hawks. The, the hawk, you know the hawk? I mean, we, we watch the Avengers. You know the hawk? Yeah. H -U -L -K, yeah. Many, many people are, are like that, spiritually. They turn to that beast and just anger. And when they cool down, oh, I don't know. You turn back to Dr. Bruce Banner and you don't know what happened. Did I cause this destruction? Something comes beyond your will. That is not freedom. When it comes up, I just can't hold this. And one prevalent thing is the spirit of lust. It's a very wicked... Look, the spirit of lust, especially when it manifests itself sexually, lust can make a person... Look, you, have to, you can be so much under the demon of lust that you find yourself attracted to Someone that you are naturally, in your right sense, is not attracted to. In fact, loss can make you attract, to be attracted to a dog. That's what loss can do. It blinds the mind, twists your mind. And a person is moved in lust. And, on, and it will not rest until it fulfills that thing it wants to fulfill. Whether it's fornication or pornography or what, you must fulfill it. And for someone who is really struggling with those things, it's after you do it, you feel bad. Be, that shows that you did not want to do it. But the spirit moved. So that is not freedom. Man is not free. 
And we keep on having those struggles. But there is good news. There is a power that is at work in us. When we know the Holy Spirit and we begin to fellowship with him, we fellowship with him via his word. Via his word, you pick the Bible, begin to pray. Read the Bible, give yourself more to the word of God and give yourself to meditation. Meditation is very important. Very important. Many things that you can read. Look, many of us, we study big things, aeronautic engineering and all manner of crazy things that are so complicated. But when it comes to the word of God, wow, it's hard to understand. Yes, I agree. The word of God is not designed with the physical, with your intellect. It is spirit. But there's also a labor that comes in. There's also a labor that comes in. As simple as just taking time to just sit down and just read a verse of scripture over again and just think about it. Just think, when you're going about your day, just be thinking about it. It's a ground for the Holy Spirit to begin to give you more understanding. So that is how we grow. It leads you into all truth. It will continue to teach you more and more of Jesus. Jesus is eternal. That means his, his knowledge is, in fact, we will continue to learn more of him even when this life is over. He's eternal. So there's only so much. If physically, the Bible said that if all the works that Jesus did were recorded, that all the books of the world cannot contain it. That's what the Bible said. So don't you think that the only things that Jesus did are the things that we read here? The Bible said all the books of the world cannot contain it. That is physically. How much more the eternal riches, the things to know of Christ. Do you know that Jesus is so vast and so rich that you can learn a new thing about him with every second of the day. <laughs> this second, you can learn something new. And that second, something new. And it can continue perpetually. That is the eternal vast riches of Christ. No, what, no wonder the seraphims as we read, each time they behold the one on the throne, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy. Lord, it's just, it's mind-blowing. So there's so much. Each day, he continues to show us more of himself. And that, that operating system is found inside of us as the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to give Jesus a chance and give ourselves to expose ourselves to the Spirit of truth, it begins to work many things in us. Number one, the Holy Spirit, purpose of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit establishes the father-son relationship between us and God. That's number one. And that is very important. It establishes the father-son relationship between us and God. Many religions of the world, you, you can't even dare to say you want to call God father. That is, and even in, in Israel, there was an abomination. Nothing angered the elders of Israel more than Jesus calling God his father. Apart from him also speaking in a, in a, almost like in a disrespectful way concerning their elders. You know, they saw people like Moses. You know, who, 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 who Moses, Moses is. In fact, the height of it was even um, Abraham. You know who Father Abraham is? And Jesus is saying, before Abraham, I am. Wow. If I were there, I would have stoned him. If I was a devout Israelite, do you know what? Our father Abraham, and you have such infantry to talk about him, that before Abraham, and note, when Kabbalah talked about the I am, he didn't say I was, I am. Before Abraham, I am. From before the foundations of the world, he was. So, apart from those two things, apart from that, but there was that he called God Father. And those were the grounds of his crucifixion. They said blasphemy because he called God Father because they knew the meaning of that. Calling God Father means, means that you are in a way equating yourself to be like God. And it was a big thing. But that is the reality of what Jesus has done for us. The world cannot receive... Okay, let us read John chapter 14. Still here, verse 17. Um, okay, verse 17. John 14. And I'll read... 17. It says, Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So, 
the world cannot receive this spirit, but it says we can receive him. I, I, I don't want to build more on that, but it's the next verse, verse 18. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you comfortless. Now, Jesus um, before then had said, I will send to you the comforter. And that comforter there, paracletos, it means an aid, a help, somebody to help you. So when you hear comfortless here, you think it's the same thing. No. The comfortless here is the word The comfortless here is the word orphanos, which is where the word orphan comes from. If you check it, it's your, your Bibles. The comfortless there is the word orphanos, you know, for, for an orphan. So what he said is that I will, not, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not leave you fatherless. I will not leave you bereaved of a father. And no wonder we are told in, now, now that we've understood that, let us... Let's put this understanding together as we read Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Or however, I can read from verse... Okay, I'll quickly read from verse 1. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all. What is that simply saying? If you are an heir, if you are the son of a billionaire, as long as you are still a child, you are no different. You are no different, different from a servant in that house. That is what, is what he's saying. So, and what does that mean? What does, when you, when you hear a child, what, what comes to mind? What comes to mind when you hear a child? A child gives us, or rather what comes to mind is lack of understanding. No understanding. So he said, though an heir, you can be sitting on top billions of dollars, but as long as you are a child, you are no different from a servant. That's what he's saying. Okay, let's continue to read. He says, they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father has set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic, you know, principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that we could, he, he could adopt us as his very own children. And I'll read verse 6 in the, in the King James. It says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the what? Spirit of his son. And that is all this thing we're talking about, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. What did Galatians call it? The spirit of the spirit of his son. No wonder Jesus will say, I'm going, but I will come unto you. He says, God has sent for the spirit of his son into where your heart and that spirit from within us is crying, what? Father, Father. Abba, Father. That's what Abba is Aramaic for Father. Abba, Father. That spirit is crying within our hearts. That is something that was not given before. But because of the Holy Spirit, it establishes that father-son relationship. And if we can come to the understanding of that relationship, it unlocks many things for us. When you learn to call God Father, to know him as your father, you know him as your father. You live, you know, you live free of the fear of some punishment or whatever. You begin to have that intimate relationship with God. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He says he said, so that's why Jesus in John 14 says, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not leave you fatherless. And that's why God will say, he said, he is the father of the fatherless. So you know that you have a father in heaven. And your father is the possessor of heavens and, 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 and the earth. 
Imagine. I don't want to call names the rich men of this world. If you just say, my father is this, he can open doors for you. Your father owns the heaven. Look at what God was saying in Psalm 50. When he was telling Israel to bring sacrifices, or rather, the Lord told Israel to bring sacrifices. Israel were disobedient to God. <laughs> he told them, look, say you guys. He said, he said, listen, oh Israel. He said, I am God. He, introduced, he, had to, he, had, he had to make it clear to them. He said, I am God, even your God. He said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. In fact, he said, every fowl on the mountains, I know them. That means if you were an Israelite and you want to bring sacrifice to God, you want to, and you go to the bush and catch a, 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 you go to the bush and catch a random chicken, God is saying that, that I know the name of that chicken. He didn't say, he said, I know every fowl on the mountain and every beast. He said, if I were hungry, I will not tell you. That is, the, that is who is your father. The, the owner of everything on this earth. And it unlocks you to the authority that you have. To have God as father. The earth is the Lord's, the Bible says, and the fullness thereof. The world and all that is therein. This power is not only to give us breakthroughs spiritually, but even in things that are material. Imagine you are going for a job and you are looking for a job. You can't find a job. Things are hard. With the understanding that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that, that are therein. That means if you are the type of person that when you go to a job interview, you are so agitated and you are, you know when um, timidity and agitation can make you not even really express yourself very well. And you are so agitated in the midst of a job interview. When you realize, I say, wait a minute. I'm, and this is by experience. It has happened to me before. And before the interview, I said, you, I said, wait a minute. I said, this person that is here, because this person that is interviewing me is owned by my father. Because he said that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world is the system. So the earth is the physical earth, terra firma. You have the mountains and the trees of the earth and the river. That is the earth, terra firma. You know, but he said the world is the system inside the earth, the cosmos. That would be the world, the systems. So is it the education system, career, financial? All these are systems in the world. It says the world and all that is therein, including the money in this world, belongs to God. When God delivered the children of, of Israel from Egypt, what are you saying? He, he told them, wait, wait a minute. You are not just going to leave Egypt like that. No, I'm going to give you the money of the Egyptians. He said you are going to spoil them. You are going to plunder them. <laughs> Can you imagine? And he said it's very simple. On the night before you go, just go. The women, I don't know why he sent the, the, the women. He said, just let your women go and borrow of the Egyptians their gold and their silver and everything. That means that you will meet, God numbed the Egyptians that if an Israelite just come and say, give me $500 right now, the Egyptian will just go and give. They don't even know what they're doing. God made them docile and converted the riches of Egypt to Israel in one night. And they went with riches. That was why they could build all that thing that we did, tabernacle. Where do you think they got all those things from? To build those things of gold and silver. It was all things that they plundered from Egypt. So also at the new birth, we came out with riches that will make us willing to do the will of God. And also, even the money, <laughs> I'm not a prosperity preacher, but even the money in this world, it's owned by the Father. So don't say, Necessarily have the mind that I'm a Christian, I have to suffer as a Christian. No. He said that he wishes that we prosper in every realm. But of course, that is the list of things. The true things we are talking about the spiritual riches. Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> so, very important. God is your father. And the Holy Spirit will continue to make that truth known to you. He will continue to expound that and make it more real. You know, when you come in prayers, it, you know how you, you, you are speaking to your father with all reverence and holiness, but yet you can feel that passion of love between you and the father. We have a father. Praise the name of the Lord. None of us are fatherless, and our father is the maker of all things. The Holy Spirit will teach and bring to remembrance John chapter 14, 
a lot of things from John 14, verse 26. We are closing. Verse 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance with us whatsoever I have said unto you. And you know, sometimes our problem is forgetfulness. Have you ever been in, in a meeting? You hear about Jesus. Whoa! You just hear some wonderful things about the word of God and you are so excited. And by the time you enter your car, if I want you to step out of the room and the first winter breeze blows on you, that breeze, first of all, just takes away everything that you've heard out. And you enter your car and drive with each passing breeze, each thing, each thing leaves you. And have you ever seen times that you are in the presence of God, you feel so powerful? And not too long after, you know, you just feel like you've forgotten any, anything and you just feel so weak. That was what James was talking about. That there are many who, who look at him, the word of God, like they are looking at a glass. And by the time they go, they forget what kind of, I think let's read that scripture. Is James, um, James, let me see. Um, I can, I can I have it? Let me take this opportunity. Mm -hmm. James 1, verse 23. Okay. Yeah, you can read. James 1, 23. For anyone who hears the word but does not carry it out. It's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after observing himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But, but after, after again, after sorry. observing himself, he goes away, he goes away and forgets what he looks like. And many times it's because it's almost like a change of, of, of reality. And that was the problem with Israel. They kept on forgetting the works of God. But the Holy Spirit, number one, not only does it teach us, it keeps us in divine remembrance. Divine remembrance. Continues to remind us in the face, in the face of temptations. That was what happened to, to Jesus. If we can all have that experience, none of us can fall to temptation. Satan himself came to tempt him. And with each temptation, Jesus brought a scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. That was divine remembrance. But many times in the face of temptation, we don't even remember anything. And we are just so consumed by the temptation and fall. So the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance. will snap you out. Hey! The fact that you are tempted, is not, and that is one trick of the enemy. When you are tempted, the enemy makes you feel like you have already sinned. No, that's a trick. Because he knows that when he makes you feel like that, you automatically feel psychologically defeated. Oh, what? I've already sinned. Fine. No. To be tempted is not a sin. <laughs> to be tempted is not a sin. You are, you are tempted. To fall to the temptation, that is where there's a sin. So he makes you feel. So if you're having some struggles, you are, you, maybe you're having an addiction, and you are tempted to do that, you're feeling like doing it, you have not sinned. And at that time, God is a present help. The Holy Spirit can bring to remember. It could be a scripture, or it could just be a remembrance of who you are in Christ. And what is your sin? say, no, I can't do this. Or he opens your eye to how filthy that thing is. You say, no way. I'm a son of God. That is what he does. So the Holy Spirit teaches you and brings things to your remembrance. He causes you to remember all things. To remember all things. And these things are for your victory. John chapter 2, first, first John chapter 2, verse 27, I'll read. It says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abided in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. It's saying that that anointing is so powerful that you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it had taught you, ye shall abide in him. For the Holy Spirit is a great teacher. He gives us 
divine supernatural understanding into scriptures, to the word of God. Understanding of principle, of divine principles that make you wiser for your, for your spiritual profit and profit in all other aspects of your life. So that's the second purpose. Number one, establishes that father-son relationship as we are living in this day of the comforter. And number two, it teaches you all things and causes you to remember so that you will overcome. The Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. It will convict you of righteousness and it will convict you of judgment. You can find that in John chapter 16, verse 17, verse 7 to 11. Some of these scriptures now we may not read again because of time. But John chapter 16, 7 to 11. He says he would convict you of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He says of sin because the world do not receive him. Now that is f- for the world. When they see the presence of the Lord, they will automatically be judged because they are sinful. But to you as a believer, the Holy Spirit reproves you of sin. It tells you what is sin and what is, you know, uh, what is sin and what is not. It reproves you of sin, you know, from the inside. Today we are living in a time that Satan is tempting people as an angel of light. That means that the distinction between sin and what is not sin has become very skewed. The devil is an angel of light, tempting people. So we need the spirit of God to give us discernment. He will tell you what is sin and what is not sin. Not to condemn you, but to reprove you and to cause you to, hey, you can do better and to help you to do it. And he will reprove you also of righteousness. And Jesus said, of righteousness because I go to the Father. It simply means because I have overcome and I am interceding for you, your righteousness is of me. And he teaches you about who you are in Christ. And when the devil loses the power of condemnation over you, he has lost his power. Anybody that can rise above condemnation, Satan has lost. Because that is his only strength. He's the slanderer. He, He slanders. That's all he does. Slanders. You. And how does he slander? Satan does not appear to you in your room with two horns. You know? And say, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, Matthew, you are a very bad man. No. He slanders you through the voice of your own mind. Through your own thoughts. You begin to think, I, I'm just not just good enough. Look at me. Look at how I acted so, 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 and so time. I can't. I, I, I cannot. I mean, I can't even come to church today. I can't worship God. You feel less of yourself. That is his strength. His strength is condemnation. But when you know the righteousness of God, the judgment, and also he says he will reprove you of judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world is judged. That means that the devil comes to condemn you. Look, let's say something quickly. Satan has no right to judge or to to judge any of us. Even if you sin before God, that is a family matter between you and your father. That's why it's good to understand God as a, as a father. If you sin before God, that is a family matter. Imagine a family matter, you are having a discussion. I don't even know. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, okay, we can use couples in the house, Ikaba and Hebziba having a private discussion, trying to sort out something between them. Pedro and Lina trying to sort out some things. You know, and then somebody comes from outside and he's saying, ah, he's talking. No, what are you talking about? That's, that is, like, what right have you to speak here? The only way, you, the only way someone can have a, a, an opinion in a family matter is if members of the family give them that hand. So you can, you can see a case, oh, yeah, Chris, come, you and my family, we're having some issues, that's fine. So now the only way you can give the devil in road into the family matter between you and God, or rather, the only way he can have entrance is for you to give him that entrance. How? By, sub, by succumbing to, the, to his voice that is speaking through your mind. To tell you you are less. You will never. Oh, some, do you know I've, in the past I've been worshipping God. Worshipping God. And I've had some struggles in my life. And I'm worshipping God. And inside my mind, I didn't hear anything. Oh, but, or rather, I didn't hear anything. But, it's just... And understanding it inside my mind, I'm like, yeah, forget it, forget it. In four, I give you 
this oh euphoria, you are so happy with the presence of God. I give you two days, it won't last. You are going to be back to that struggle. I'm sure, I don't know if, if we experience that. You can be so high with God and you just know that like I'm soon going to go down again to the valley. That is the voice of the, of, 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 of the devil. That's all he does. He condemns. He's, a, he, he's an accuser. He's called the accuser of the brethren. But the word of God said, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Who accused us before our God? Day and night. He doesn't rest. Even when Lynn is doing something good, he's still looking. He said, no, God, look at what she did. No, he, he doesn't rest. He accuses us before God day and night. So that is his job. So when I feel content, I say, ah, Satan is, he's only performing the job description. So I allow him to do his job. The only thing you can say is just to say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Out. And you come before your God, before your father, and sort out what you need to sort out as his spirit guides you. So this is very important. He will reprove the word of sin. He will tell you what is sin, of righteousness. He would, he would reveal to you your standing in, 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 in God who you are in Christ. And he will reprove the word of judgment because Satan has already been judged. <laughs> he has already been judged. And he will reprove, he, he, would, he, would, he would convict you of those things. You will be full of understanding regarding the judgment of the Lord and even as it relates to your own life. Hallelujah. So this is very um, um, important. The result of this thing is that he begins to regenerate us. By his power that worketh within us. You know, we can read to refer, we can just write it, we, we don't need to read in the book of Titus, chapter 3, 3 to 7. We see some things there in Romans chapter 8, verse, verse um, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, 22 to 24. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Actually, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we read that one. Philippians 2, 3. I, just, I know, I, I suspect I have overshot the time. Yeah. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, <laughs> sorry, verse 13, not 3. Philippians 2, 13, are we there? Yeah, Philippians 2, 13. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God. And he does that through his Holy Spirit within you. He helps you. He, he enables you as you yield yourself to him. How do you yield? You know, I try to avoid us using grammar and English. It's practical. How do you yield yourself? To the Holy Spirit, surround yourself with things of God, with the right spiritual environment. That's how you yield yourself. If you, look, you are more susceptible to fall to sin when if you are going to walk, Ekeba, Ekeba talked about the things that are holy, secular, and profane. You are more susceptible to fall to sin if when you are going to walk, you just put, you know, um, you, know you put um, Jay-Z on your, on, on your ear. And you're listening to Jay-Z rap. You're more susceptible to that than if you're going and you were just playing a worship song and worshiping God. That is a practical way to yield yourself to the spirit. Surround yourself with spiritual things. With the word of God. Pray. That's one way. And you continue to grow in the spirit. But God, it is God that helps you to do his will. And the last point is that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And not just to pray, but to pray the right prayers. He helps us to pray. You know, there seems to be a contradiction. Because in John chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus said that if you ask anything in my name, he said, I will give it to you. you know? He said, if you ask anything in my name, John 14, 13, I would, I would give it to you. And many times, I have looked at that thing as as a scam because I, I you know times of, of struggle I'm talking about many times in the day, but I'm like God like Jesus are you Jesus are you just playing with us because you are clearly saying in your word that whatsoever ye ask in my name that will I do that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask anything in my name I will do it 
And then Brother Clay stands up and says, All right. So, Lord, I need one Lamborghini. And the Lamborghini doesn't appear. So, what's up? You said if I ask anything, you know, and that's why James now had to say in James chapter 4, verse 3, he says, You pray, but you do not receive it. Why? Because you pray amiss. And you pray for the purpose of fulfilling your lust. I say, oh, wow. So that's it. So what Jesus was saying, it's not just, that's why he, no wonder he said, in my name. It has to be according to his will. He said he will give us, um, um, what's the scripture? Sorry. Um, yeah, according to his will, according to his will, according to his will, <laughs> sorry, the scripture just, went away from my uh, mind. But anyway, 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 is according to his will. He says, he, the Lord will supply all, okay, your needs according to his wish, to his, uh, to his riches in glory. He said he will supply all your needs. Of course, this scripture did not say he will supply all your wants, anything that you just want, but he will supply all your needs. And think about it, if again you understand the father-son principle, understand many things yeah okay yes first john 5 14 in the book of first john chapter 5 verse 14 and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us yes and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have the request that we have asked of him amen yeah and that is it Asking him according to his name. However, it is according to his will. Again, if we understand the father-son principle, think about it. You have a kid, you know, and my, and my son, uh, or your, you know, your child just comes and says, uh, hey, daddy, 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 I want, I want, I want, I want acid. You know, your child says he wants acid. And you say, no, I'm not going to give you acid. You know, that child can cry. And if it's a child that is not properly you know, behaved. You can even say, I hate you. <laughs> I want acid. You can imagine a child crying. My kid would take battery to put inside his mouth. The other day, I think it was, it was battery. And I took the battery from him and he was crying bitterly that I stopped him from eating battery. That is how we are many times with God. We think we know what is good for ourselves, but he's our father. He knows what he knows. He knows you more than you even know yourself. To many times, I, I want this job. You believe so much, but God has seen ahead many things that we cannot even see. And he somehow pushes that away and gives you the one that you desire. So, so it's according to his will. But, and that is why praying rightly is very important. And this is the last verse we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So in the place of prayer, he helps you. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be put to intelligible words. He says, and he... Okay, I'll read in the NLT. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. That is verse 27 of Romans 8. He, he, he makes he, uh, make it intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit helps you in prayer. He gives you the strength to pray, number one, and it even helps you to pray in line with God's will. And many times that comes in the outflow of either praying in the spirit, speaking in tongues, praying, you speak mystery. It says that he that prays in the spirit or speaks in tongues, speaketh in an, un, in an unknown language that to his intelligence it sounds like foolishness, but in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Spiritual language is not the same as the language of, of you know, that we know. Some king, a king was messing up and a hand came and wrote a judgment concerning him on a wall. Many, many tekel or passing. And they didn't understand whatever that was. What is, to them, that is gibberish. But it meant something. 
And they had to call Daniel. And Daniel had to come and say, Mene. <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, you have been weighed in the balance. Take care. <laughs> the, is it, what is it again? He said, you have been weighed in the balance. Pretty much the meat and the patience are coming to destroy you severely because of your sins. Many, many take care of passing. So spiritual language may not be intelligible to us, but tomorrow we will trust God to have a, in fact, tomorrow is going to be this style that we've done, you know, uh, it's not going to be so at least uh, when I come up tomorrow, it will be an interactive session. We will discuss, but we'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the giftings of the Holy Spirit and have, you know, just have a conversation about it, you know. So, and when we talk about the gift of the Spirit, we will see that there's the gift of, this, of speaking in tongues, gift of diverse kinds of tongues, and gift of interpretation of those tongues. So, but the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, gives us an uncommon energy to just press on in the Spirit. So, may the Lord help us as we live in the reality of the Spirit. So, I want us to begin to pray, actually. You know, I want us to begin to pray begin to speak to the Lord and just go in a time of, of prayer and worship. But Jesus said, he that uh, believed, he says, out of your bellies will f- come forth rivers of living water. To begin to stir up the presence of the Holy Spirit that is within us. First of all, we'll begin to pray. The beginning, we say, Lord God. I think the first prayer is that we should pray for understanding. For the Lord to open the, the, the eyes of our understanding. To begin to know him for who he is. That the power of his spirit will be unlocked within us. Because when we begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, we walk as supernatural men. We walk beyond the realm of the natural. And I don't want to go into stories and experiences that we've had. Just walking in the spirit. Many things that has been adverted. Many things, signs and wonders done by a flow of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it changes you into another man. The king, Saul, when the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, the Bible said that Saul began to prophesy and was turned to another man. Peter. Peter was, Peter denied Jesus three times. In the presence of a little girl, he said, I, d- I don't know that man. And the same Peter that was so afraid and thinking that they are going to crucify him with Jesus because he was associated with him, the same Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell and lifted his voice all over Israel and said, Ye men of Judah, Jude, hearken unto my voice. Boldness came upon him. The Holy Spirit changes us, completely overwhelms. And gives us abilities that we naturally do not have. Naturally speaking, I've said it many times here, I stand naturally, if I tell anybody that I stammer, naturally, I'm a stammer, I'm sure you would have even picked it a few times that I've I've been speaking. You would say, this guy has a stutter. But I just don't have a stutter. I stutter very badly. Badly. I can't speak at work many times. Including today at work, I'm talking at work, I'm, you know, I'm stuttering. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon me, if I stand to preach the word of God, that disappears. That it, it gives us abilities, things that we naturally do not have, but it comes. And so let's just begin to pray. Hallelujah. Let's begin to pray. Are you? Okay, you want to go? Let's just, let's begin to open ourselves to the power of the Spirit of God. And just say, Lord God, overshadow me. Overshadow me. There is no wonder that the Holy Spirit has not done. He made a woman who has never known a man to conceive of a seed. He told told Mary that the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. The power of the Most High shall come upon you. And you shall receive of a holy seed. Today, that same Spirit that came upon Mary, that she received of that Holy Seed Christ, is coming upon us and we will receive deposit of the power of God and he will help us to nurture it because he said in his word that it is God that causes us makes us to be willing to do of his good pleasure 
Let's just begin to ask God for help. Say, Lord God, overshadow me. Completely overwhelm me by your presence. Do not be intimidated by any current circumstance.